uh, tough going. A lot of the way we had to actually build bridges, even along cliff sides, uh, crossing the river several times. And eventually we left the gorge and climbed out up into the snow. And even at 4,000 meters, three and a half thousand meters, still in the forest, the effects of altitude start to become uh, known to us. You can, any amount of reading will not prepare you for the devastation that occurs with, with altitude. The, 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 mainly is, well, physically of course, but psychologically is a real blow because especially at that age, you know, you, un, you think you're unstoppable, yet lack of oxygen, even half the level of oxygen in the atmosphere stops you in your tracks. Uh, when you first get to altitude, it's really like having a bad hangover. You feel nauseous, you've got a constant headache, and you lose your appetite, and you generally feel incredibly lethargic, so that I couldn't, couldn't imagine how it was possible to go much higher than base camp when I first got there. And uh, with that in mind, our strategy was to, well, we had it tied together by our rope, we'd shortened it, so it was about 10 metres between us, and the strategy was that if one of us slipped, the other would just jump off the other side of the ridge and, and the rope would hopefully snag. Well, Lincoln was a bit heavier than me, but anyway. Um, we continued along. It actually got, it's always harder than it looks and it's always much further than it looks. It's like any big project. You know, there are unforeseen things along the way. Um, it always takes longer than you expect and it's no different on a mountain. You know, the, the nice looking snow ridge turned out to be much steeper. The snow was deeper. Um, despite being deep snow, there was very, it's just soft powder. Underneath that soft powder was hard ice. It was slippery. And, you know, we were literally reduced to going very slowly. And by nightfall, we'd only gotten halfway along the ridge. It was, we didn't want to turn back. Uh, we thought, well, we're gonna, we're gonna bivvy. People have bivvied much higher. And um, so we stomped out an area in the snow. We, we just had the clothes that we, we wore. We didn't have a sleeping bag. Uh, we, we, we did have a down jacket each. Uh, that was it. And, um, well, we sat down for a very, very long night. As a last minute thing back in camp, I'd thrown a tin of John West cherries. We always give your sponsor a plug. Um, as a treat. And uh, that's what we had for dinner. We were so inexperienced that we didn't have any stoves that worked really well at altitude. So we decided not to bring a stove, which was nearly a fatal mistake, because the problem at altitude, I don't know if any of you have been, you know, had a training in science, but you know, the problem with altitude, as you go up in altitude, the air pressure gets less, and that's why there's less oxygen. And as the air pressure gets less, the, um, your body dehydrates more quickly, water evaporates more quickly, uh, plus your breathing at three, three times the rate, four times the rate that you do down here. So you dry out very quickly, you dehydrate, and you've got to drink. You can't drink if you don't have a stove. Our water, water bottles are frozen. The syrupy juice surrounding the black cherries was nectar, but there wasn't much in it. Because I carried the can, I got the extra cherry, there were an uneven number of cherries. It was a very long night. Anyway, we woke up shivering and vowed to keep after having suffered so much, we, 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 we'd have to keep going. So we did in the face of a growing wind. About midday, Lincoln said he'd had enough. He said, look, if I keep going, I, I don't think I'll have the strength to get back again. So he, he, he just found a place out of the wind and fell asleep in the sun. I felt like doing the same thing, but I thought, no, no, I've got, you know, we're not gonna get anywhere. If it, you know. So I raced up to the summit, getting there just in time to get a glimpse of Tibet, which was really exciting because I'd always had this vision of Tibet. It was forbidden land back then in the late 70s. So lovely brown rolling hills and total contrast to the deep gorges of the south. Turned my back on the summit, raced down, shook Lincoln awake. Um, and then, well, we had an epic. A storm came in, it was an electrical storm. It was, you know, we, we were actually discharging off our bodies, so it was very painful. There weren't, there weren't any lightning strikes on us, but it was like having a coat that was like attached to an electric fence. You'd get these shocks. And um, 
eventually, you know, we were forced to be, just crawl along the ridge because the wind was so strong. Our eyelashes were freezing together. We didn't have goggles. We just had these glacier glasses, which are useless. The end of the day saw us still there and having to abseil down in the dark. And, and, uh, anyway, cut a long story short, we did get back to our top camp. Unfortunately, Lincoln had sustained a bit of frostbite on the last few hours of the descent. The team was galvanised into action and um, they carried him down. And a week later, he was airlifted out from base camp by the Indian Army. Now, we fully expected to have to pay for this uh, evacuation, but we never, well, the bill didn't arrive until 10 years later. <laughs> I kid you not. It's a difficult thing to explain. Why go through so much suffering? I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's plain hard work being at altitude, but the other side of the coin is it, it's just, it is the greatest challenge you can have. This is the greatest physical, physical challenge you can have. And it takes place in the most spectacular part of the planet. It really, especially if you love mountains, I mean, it's just, they're the ultimate mountains. And I found that, I, you know, I just wanted to go back. And so we went on a couple of smaller trips and then eventually in 1981, a friend invited us to join him on a climb of this iconic peak, <coughs> which is just south of Mount Everest. Having it there over my shoulder all the time for three weeks, I couldn't help wondering what it's like up there. <laughs> That's what it's like with Mount, you know? What's it like up there? And then I sort of started dreaming. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be nice? Or wouldn't it be great if you know, to climb Everest properly, to do it alpine style, without oxygen, no Sherpa support, via a new route? Part, total pipe dream. Everest was still, had some mystery about it. Not much was known about the north side because it had been closed. <laughs> only just opened a, um, the year prior. The Chinese had, had it closed since, well, since um, before the Chinese took over Tibet. This is actually a shot taken by NASA from the International Space Station. And that is Everest. That's the north face of Everest. And then eventually found ourselves on top. I mean. Uh, if I look back on all my climbs, I think Annapurna 2 is probably the one, the greatest sense of achievement, just because of our level of experience, which wasn't great, and the, just the amount of um, perseverance and setbacks that we had. And th they continued after the summit because the weather came in ferociously, uh, massive snowstorm, and by now we'd run totally out of food. We'd been up high so long that we really had to keep going, otherwise we're going to just run out of, run out of steam. And uh, by the, by the time we got back to advanced base, we were right at the end of our tether. And, um, but it was the case for the last five days where um, we'd wake up in the morning and wonder whether we were going to be alive at the end of the day. We really, you know, just, you know it was touch and go. And so here, Greg Mortimer, who joined us on this climb, with Andy and uh, Lincoln, uh, in the tent, the, the, on the first morning that we woke up and think, we made it, we're going to survive. The route up behind there. Back home, we'd been reported as missing. <laughs> Actually, not good for our families, but good PR for, um, yeah, Greg showing off his high altitude physiology. Good, good PR for um, going to, raising money for Everest. Back down in the valley, the locals overjoyed to see, seeing us alive and uh, very, very kind to us. Yeah, it's a benefit of hindsight. We'd lost all our gear. Luckily, there was a film crew whose job was to film us from the bottom of the mountain. They had to do a bit of glacier travel, so they had been equipped with crampons and ice axes and boots. Not as good as what we'd lost, but good enough. The only problem with my feet, I've got size 12 feet, no one else had size 12 feet. So I had to, well, I had to give up climbing or adapt my cross-country ski boots as climbing boots, which I did in the great tradition of Australians being innovative and, you know, making do with what you've got on hand. It worked okay. I did find on steep ice, though, uh, such as here, that my feet would slip out of my boots. Quite disconcerting. Anyway, so I was helping Greg up to, um, up to the next, well, proper camp, too, when we were sending the fixed ropes, and uh, I was actually relieving myself. So I deta detached myself from the fixed rope, gone around the corner a bit, and I was enjoying the view and, you know, I was about to get back on the fixed rope when I heard a muffled roar. And I looked to either side, nothing, I looked up and thought, 
it, it was an avalanche and it was a big one. And, you know, I thought we'd be safe from avalanches, but this was such a, because beside me was this massive gully, which all the avalanches tend to get funneled into. But this was such a big avalanche that it got, um, as a funnel, it jumped out of that funnel of the, of the Great Couloir. And I just had enough time to lurch over to the rope, hang on. And, you know, for about a minute, I was pummeled by this incredible force fully expecting to be swept off by a big lump of ice or rock. It never came and suddenly, you know, I was in clear, clear air again, but every crevice of a um, bit of clothing, I, I had to get totally undressed and shake everything out. And I found myself just there naked in the sun, drying out, shivering like a leaf. It wasn't because I was cold, it was because I was, I'd been so frightened by it. Luckily, Greg has survived too back up at the snow cave um, where I left Lincoln to dig a snow cave. He'd um, told us that it was okay. So it was, it was a lucky um, lucky escape, but it did, did prove this, um, this little foothold we had on the mountain in the snow cave, place for the snow cave was actually pretty safe. Very tempting to give up. You know, just two thirds, we've got two thirds of the mountain to go. The hardest two thirds physically. We had a couple of false starts, but luckily, we managed to keep ourselves psychologically motivated so that for, on the third attempt, uh, we still had, um, well, we still had that fire in us to maybe we can do it. It's, it's only a maybe, there's still a lot of uncertainty. This is Jeff emptying his pee bottle. <laughs> it's, um, this is in the snow cave, it's actually got a bit of a crack in the back of it, so it's perfect for liquid waste. Um, you know, it's hard work getting out of his sleeping bag, going outside. So we reserved that for number twos, but um, anyway, <laughs> it was an amazing sunset. I must say, I've, I've never, ever experienced such a, an incredible vision because there was literally every color of the rainbow in, in the scene before us. And, you know, there's, there's always a sense of euphoria when you get to the top, no more up. And it's just this relief which floods you particularly on a climb like this where it was an uncertain thing right until the last few minutes. But on top of that euphoria, you very quickly impose the discipline because you know that you're only halfway and there's no point in getting to the top unless you get down, back down again. And that's weighing very heavily on your mind, especially as it's about to get dark. <laughs> so we turned our backs on the summit 